One of the things I find most interesting when two explorers get together is we sort of trade stories. This is Life's Tough, but explorers are tougher. I'm your host, Richard Weiss. I love the outdoors. I always have, and I always will. I've heard stories that would make the hair on the back of your neck stand up. Explorers are the type of people who walk in space, go to the bottom of the ocean, and stand on the highest summits. Scratch the surface of any explorer, and you'll find they're all storytellers. This show is about their tales. This episode is brought to you by the Podcast Services Division at Life's Tough Media. Having your own podcast allows you to creatively reach all types of audiences, from clients to prospects, to your most loyal membership base. And by utilizing studio affiliates located around the world, coupled with quality remote recording capabilities, Life's Tough Media makes having a corporate podcast easier than ever before. Contact us for a no-obligation consultation at info at lifestuff.com or visit lifestuff.com to learn more. Our guest today is the author of a fabulous book called Way Out There, Adventures of a Wilderness Trekker, which is an account of solo backpacking for over a half a century in some of the most rugged and remote places on earth. Welcome to Life's Tough, Explorers Are Tougher, J.R. Harris. Hi, J.R. Hey, how you doing, Richard? Hey, so what, I, I, I love what I, that title, Life's Tough. Yeah, well, great. you you know it very well. Um, when when I say in the introduction part that you've been solo hiking for over a half a century, doesn't when you throw something century, you go really? Is that me? <laughs> yeah, you know it doesn't uh, it doesn't really sound realistic like it was something here, but you know what? Sometimes I remember some of those uh, tough days out there, and it seems like two centuries. You know? So to to just give people um, an idea, right now you're sitting in your hometown. You grew up in uh, Queens, New York. 1963 World's Fair was there. Uh, the Mets play there. Uh, I think Paul Simon is from there. You know, a, a lot of people are from uh, the borough of Queens. So growing up in Queens, it wouldn't, seemed to me that that would be the likely entry point into a lifetime of solo wilderness hiking. Well, nothing gets by you, does it, Richard? I mean, <laughs> uh, yeah, the, the folks I grew up with uh, to this day think it's, you know, it's odd, it's strange. People in my family are still, uh, uh, that they, they still think it's, it's such an odd thing to do. But, you know, you never know. Queens is that kind of a borough, man. It must be the uh, water that we're drinking out here or something. Man. Yeah, the, the many qualities of Queens, water wouldn't be one of them, JR. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's interesting. When I was a kid, there was something in me, like if there was a, a really snowy day, like blowing wind, I love to go out there. And for that brief moment, I dreamt I was in the Arctic, you know, that I was somewhere out on the tundra. And, and, you know, I couldn't wait to see what was beyond where I lived. And so when I talk to a lot of explorers, that's something similar. What, do you remember that sort of pivotal point or those moments as a kid? Oh yeah, definitely. Uh, and it was exactly like you described, you know, I, I always wanted to be a mountain man. You know, I, I studied, you know, Lewis and Clark expedition and, and, and Jim Bridger and, you know, all of the uh, trappers and traders and pioneers, Davy Crockett. But the, the, this, this image of, you know, a guy dressed in buckskin and he's got his pack horse there, pack train, and he's got his little mangy dog and a musket, they're disappearing into the mountains, you know, to a trap and hunt and all that. And, you know, coming back, you know, alone, you know, a year later, you know, to trade his pelts for supply. Yeah, you know, and I, and I said, you know, geez, uh, you know, I was born 100 years too late, you know. Uh, but, you know, as it turned out, it wasn't too late after all, you know. It's a, there was a big world out there for me to check out. And uh, I learned how to do it from the Boy Scouts and went right from there. But so, yeah, it was unusual for New York City. 
Was was there any one person or one event that you think uh, kicked it off? Uh, there was an event. You know, there was when I was about sixteen. Uh, I went to a movie. A movie came out called Alexander the Great, starred um, uh, the woman who was married, the, the guy who was married to uh, Elizabeth Taylor. I don't remember his Richard name. Richard Burton. Richard Burton. And it was Technicolor, it's a real new thing, you know? So I go to the movie and in this movie, uh, young Alexander is like 16 years old, about the same age I was at the time. And he's talking to Socrates, his, his teacher. Socrates says, hey, listen, what would you rather have? A short, exciting life or a long, dull life? And so of course, Alexander says a, a short, exciting life. He goes on to capture, uh, uh, most of the known world before he dies at 33. So now I'm walking home from the movie and I'm saying, wow, you know, what an intriguing question. I'm the same age. Uh, what would I pick? And I said, yeah, you know, I would pick a short, exciting life anytime. And, and it seems like almost from that moment, my life got to be really very exciting. But then when I finally turned 33, Wait, 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 wait. There's a lot of distance between 16 and yeah. 33. So JR, you're you're 16. You yeah. get home, you realize that your father was not the king and you were not going to inherit the, right. the largest known empire. So take me, ha, what's the scheming in a young J.R. Harris's mind? So I knew I was from a, a whole different world than uh, Alexander the Great, but an exciting life, the way I would describe it in my life, in my lifetime, you know, not back in the Middle Ages or, or antiquity, uh, there's still a lot of excitement to have. And then right after that, so my folks uh, decided to put me in the Boy Scouts and send me away to, uh, to the Catskills to the summer camp in the mountains. I'd never been in the mountains. I'd never been anywhere near mountains. I had no idea what it was like. You know, I, I, I tell people, you know, the first time I ever saw grass, I tried to smoke it. <laughs> no, I just had no clue, you know, and but the, I learned how to read a map and use a compass and build a fire in the pouring down rain and track animals and, and all this stuff. And it was really exciting. And we were allowed at our camp, if you were proficient enough and you had camping, cooking, pioneering merit badges, you could go off on your own for up to four days. You could take food out of the uh, uh, dispensary there and you could tell you know, your people where you're going and you can go and make a camp on your own in the woods for up to four days. And I would spend the entire summer almost alone. I will come back every four days, get more food, tell everybody I was okay, and it disappeared again. And it was just so exciting and it just went from there. That's re that's a remarkable story because you know Queens is a fairly densely populated place, mm -hmm. and you can't really go virtually anywhere and not be within like a hundred yards of somebody. Mm -hmm. So the first time that you are alone, what was that feeling for you? Wow, it it was surreal. You know, I mean, uh, I I didn't really realize how used to the noise I was, how used to the traffic I was. I, 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 I couldn't get wrapped around, you know, how there were no people out there, how I could see broad expanses of the sky and not be blocked out by skyscrapers. Uh, it, was, it was like being on another planet in a way. It was so different from, from what I was used to when I grew up in. Uh, and at first I was intimidated, you know, just by being there. But gradually, and not even really that gradually, you know, I, I really started picking up on stuff uh, about how to live out there and be comfortable out there. And it just opened up a whole other side of my personality. Uh, my perspective changed. And I, I really, um, even though I knew that all those skills I was learning, I wouldn't be able to use them when I got back home, the, the confidence that it gave me. Uh, and and it, it, I was a different person. When I came back from, 10 Mile River Scout Camp at the end of the summer that first year, uh, I was a different kid. And I went back another four or five years to that camp. Couldn't wait until June to, to get back up there. And, and that's really uh, what started it. You know, uh, just being out there in the mountains, 
Uh, and I also learned uh, about respecting the wilderness and the environment. And um, uh, it, was, it was just for a, for a young city kid like me, um, it, was, it was a whole different lifestyle. It was a whole different experience. Very, very exciting, just like I, I envisioned it after the movie. You know, it's funny because I think that um, when you describe that to people, there's a very romantic notion of it. And um, there will be people, and I'm going to use New York City as an example because I lived there for a lot of years. Some people are like, you tell that story, and they, they really, there's envy. They're like, wow, I wish I could do that. That sounds great. And then there's other people who are going to go, why are you going to do that? It's cold. It's damp. It's you know, all, all those other things that they're just like, why would you possibly do that? So when you say that you changed, I mean, what did your parents say about this? What did your siblings or what did your, uh, what, you know, who was your best friend when you were 16? You remember? Uh, I had a lot of friends, you know, we grew up in projects and there were a thousand kids, you know, and, and we all, you know, grew up together and it was really great. Uh, when I started to disappear for the summer because I went up to uh, camp, uh, of course I didn't see them, but I would come back and they would say, dude, why do you do that? You know, why would you want to sleep on the ground? You know, why would you want to sleep in a tent? Why would you want to carry a pack? And there was no way I could, uh, I could explain it. You know, my family thought it was fine. You know, my parents who were like the greatest two people that, that, that ever lived, totally got it. They understood who I was. They knew I was very independent. Uh, they knew I, I liked to be out on my own and I, I liked to discover things. So they encouraged it. And really the rest of the people, they came around to, you know, listen, I would never do it, they said, but I'm glad you do it because somebody needs to do it and come back and tell us, you know, what it's like out there. So, so as a 16 or 17 or 18 year old boy from New York City, when you're out in the wilderness, you're running into other people who are kind of like that. How is that experience from going to a lot of people to probably seeing other one or two groups? I mean, what was your perception or how are they perceiving you? Well, uh, to be honest, uh, where I would go, I would hardly see anybody. You know, uh, I never would, you know, I mean, I did walk on the Appalachian Trail or places that have a lot of, uh, a lot of hikers. But my preference was to, was to pack a, a backpack and go off where I would purposely not see anybody. I wanted to be isolated. I wanted to be alone. I wanted to be a mountain man. I wanted to be that guy who was by himself the whole year, had to depend only on his, his, his uh, wits and, and his courage and his knowledge. And, um, so the few people that I saw were kind of like me, and I never had a problem with people out there. But for the most part, uh, I was happiest when there was just nobody around and it was just me. And it seemed like I was the only one on the planet, like the whole planet belonged just to me. And it was fine. So, I mean, th that's, uh, again, a really great analogy. And, and again, back when you did this, there were not people, uh, you didn't have a cell phone, you didn't have a GPS. None of those things had been invented. And, and, I, and I know now having kids and in the neighborhood I live in, I, I feel like kids are raised like little veals in very protected crates. You must have had some things that happened along that way where you're like, oh my God, if I don't get out of this, you know, I ain't getting out of this. Yeah. Well, yeah, I had, you know, uh, scary um, uh, incidents back, you know, every once in a while, but, uh, it was really me who wanted to be there. So if I, you know, if I went out and it started snowing or if I got lost uh, or, or something of that nature, I, I always would come back to, you know, <laughs> you have nobody to blame but yourself. This is the <laughs> life that you wanted. If you wanted to have uh, excitement, you wanted to have adventure, you got it, buddy. You know, and, and so, you know, if it's part of the territory that you have to, uh, you have to deal with, you know, circumstances that, that weren't anticipated. Hey, you know, that's part of it, you know, and, and, it, and it really shaped me a lot, you know, and so I'm glad they all happened. Uh, I'm glad I'm still here to talk about it. 
but o- it, over a half a century later too. And, and I, I, you know, yeah. I know you, so I know you have all your fingers and toes and, Science. you know, yeah, all, that's when, whenever you meet uh, Everest climbers or um, people are real uh, Arctic or Antarctic physios, you're always looking at their fingers to see if they're <laughs> all there. JR, what was it you think? I mean, you've had to reflect upon this because having the conscious choice of doing this solo versus versus sharing the experience, you've made that conscious choice. So what is it do you think about your personality that wanted you to do it by yourself versus going with a, a buddy or, or, or somebody you wanted to share it with? Well, first thing I have to say is that uh, I have gone out with friends, not very often, uh, and not very many friends. I never went out with more than three people at a time, uh, and usually only one other person. Uh, I say that to say that every single trip I ever took with a friend or a, or a couple of friends has been great. You know, uh, it, we had a really good time. You know, I really enjoyed it. Uh, and so it's not like I'm antisocial or I'm a hermit or a misanthrope, I'm not any of that, you know, I'm, but you know, the, the, what it comes down to is there were, there were things that I wanted to see. There were, there were experiences that I wanted to have. There were places I wanted to go and nobody I knew, you know, shared that desire at the same level as me. And so I knew that if, if I wanted that fulfillment, if I wanted really to, to experience it, I would have to go by myself. I would not wait and try, or try to talk anybody into it. Um, I would just organize a trip and I would go. And luckily, I was very comfortable being alone and going out on my own. And so really the impetus uh, to, be, uh, to go solo was uh, not that I was antisocial, but because I had objectives and I had wishes and desires what I wanted to see and how I wanted to live out there that nobody in my neighborhood growing up out here in New York City had that. And so it was, listen, buddy, if you want to go, just go. You have to go by yourself, you know, whether I was driving to Alaska or walking around in the Adirondacks. uh, I was usually alone. I was used to it. I liked it. And, uh, you know, and I was a mountain man, baby. <laughs> hey, so did you ever take any of your friends from the projects? You must have had somebody said, wow, JR, the next time you go, I'd like to come too. No. <laughs> really? <laughs> Nobody. No, Nobody. They, so, you know, I, I don't even, you know, I, to be honest, when, when my folks first put me in the Boy Scouts, I didn't want to go. It was the last thing I wanted to do. You know, I begged them, please don't send me up to, to the mountains, I don't want to go there. And so I got it. I understood why my friends uh, couldn't, couldn't visualize what that would be like. And certainly they, they didn't want to go. I didn't know until I got there. So, I mean, let's take this one step further. There, there is now deemed a bit of a crisis with kids in the outdoors. And where I live, there are plenty of outdoors, so a kid can't help but see the outdoors by just getting in the car or walking out on the lawn or all that other stuff. So project this to New York City. There's still a bit of a crisis of getting people out into the wilderness. How does one accomplish that? Why do people from New York City, you feel, not necessarily, or from the projects, not necessarily have that vision of being in the wilderness? Well, I think it's mostly because None of us, and I put myself in that category when I was really young, um, none of us knew anybody who did it. We never had any stories about people who went out there and came back and said, hey, here's what it's like. You go on a nice camping trip, you know, you, you cook out, you sleep in a tent. It was, it was, it was just so different. And, and without that um, knowledge, that reinforcement from people who've been out there, there was no way anybody wanted to go. We didn't know what it was like. And now uh, it's pretty much the same. There are more people going out. And I, pe- I think people are starting to realize uh, what all the benefits are of being outdoors. And so it's a little easier to, uh, to convince people to go out and take a hike or a walk or a ski or whatever. 
Um, and I know that, you know, in my, in my business, I work uh, as I have clients who are uh, government uh, agencies like the National Park Service, the U.S. Forest Service. And I, I consult with them on how to get people, especially urban people, uh, to get outdoors. But for me, growing up, there was nobody. There was nobody out there. And, and, and when you look at TV or the movies, you never saw a person of color. You never saw anybody that, that looks like me out there. And so there was no incentive to go. So uh, just for the audience who's not seeing you, uh, you would classify yourself as African-American. And uh, when you say urban people, we're talking about uh, Latino. We're talking about African-American. You're talking about kids who um, wouldn't necessarily have a role model, another African-American that they see or another Latino that they recognize as a an outdoorsman. And so who, when you used to walk out into the wilderness, I have to imagine in the 19, say, 70s, that a young African-American kid coming down the trail is a little bit of an anomaly himself. <laughs> uh, yeah, you could go back even to the 1960s. <laughs> All right, let's go back to the 60s. Summer <laughs> of love. Go ahead, JR. Where are you? <laughs> yeah, I would walk down and, you know, I would see another hiker, another group of hikers. Uh, and, and they would look at me like uh, I was some alien that just got off a spaceship and, uh, you know, and, and be so surprised as to actually say to me, wow, <laughs> I never saw a black person out here. That's incredible. And I would say to them, you know, I never saw one either. You know, that's, <laughs> so it's really incredible. So, so uh, I mean, did you ever run into it? I mean, you had to have run into other uh, people of color on the trail at some point. No. Never. Uh, not until maybe the, over the last year or two, you know, that I've been going out and and even and there would be, you know, like recently I was in Denali, I was in the uh, the Wind River in in Wyoming, you know, places where there are a lot of people out there, and so you know, over the last few years, you would see more people of color. Uh, not only backpacking, but I, I like to ski uh, summer and winter. You know, you still don't see many, but you see a lot more now. But yeah, back in the day, forget it. You didn't see anybody. But, you know, you, I, I've always felt, and you and I have known each other a little while now, and that that your perspective is actually very optimistic and very um, moving forward. And I, I think that the, the diversity and inclusion subject is a very difficult subject for most people to talk about. And, you know, I can give you from my perspective as a, you know, European American male, that it can be uncomfortable because I feel like, um, I love the notion of a very uh, div diverse world, but I find that it's very difficult for me because I have original sin, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm a white guy. And so, I, I feel like it's, it's, it's sometimes a difficult conversation, but you have a, a special really skill of um, putting those fears to rest and make people have an open dialogue where they don't feel like they're going to misstep. I think th that that's one of your qualities. So how is it that you do it and what's your perspective on all these things? Well, again, it goes back to, uh, you know, being me being a kid growing up in New York City, uh, where I grew up in the projects, we had everybody. I mean, you know, there were there were black people, Latinos, the Jewish, uh, Arabs, everything. And so all the kids my age, you know, when I was, gee, 10, 12, 13, I was already in a diverse environment. And, you know, you learn about, not only about how other people live, but, you know, you're going into your friend's houses you know, the, the different smells, the different clothing that they wear, the different music that's playing, uh, the different food that they're cooking. You know, you're just, you're absorbing it without really knowing the word diversity, without even being aware of it. It's just me and my friends, they, they speak all different languages, they're all different religions. And so it was part of how I grew up. I was already used to it, you know, growing up here in New York City. And so, uh, you know, and 
I, I realized, and, and my, my parents were very uh, adamant in, in, in making sure we understood that there are good and bad people in every race, in every culture, in every religion. And so don't judge people by their color or by their anything external. You know, some people are good, some people are bad, and just deal with the good people and let the bad people go, regardless of, of what they look like or who they are, even if they look like you. If they're bad, they're bad. And, and for a kid, it was pretty straightforward, and that's the way we were raised. So in, in America right now, and even in the world, it seems like people have gotten more tribal, that they, they really are putting themselves as a group and planting sort of flags. And I'm not just talking about at the White House, um, that people are planting flags. What is the um, the positive aspect of a, and I'm going to go now to science and uh, the outdoors, what is the benefit to society or, or humankind from having a diverse world? H how does that make it better and not more uncomfortable? Well, here I'm no expert, but I have been traveling around for many, many years. And one thing that, I, that I've learned is that in a way, you know, at the end of the day, we're more similar than we are different. You know, I, I've been around the world 13 times. And, you know, I can tell you that everybody that I've met, you know, wherever I've been, people want the same thing. You know, they want to raise their kids. They want to uh, get them educated. They want them to be healthy. They want the next generation to be a little bit better than they were. And uh, yeah, so even though people wear different clothes and speak different languages, you know, at the, if you take the time to learn and, and, and interact with people, you know, the differences seem to kind of fade away after a while. And uh, you realize that there's a lot of common ground. And, and that's what I, uh, I was picking up as a kid growing up. And that's what I've learned, you know, as, as an adult since then. Is, is that uh, one of the reasons that you, despite wanting to be a mountain man, have ultimately chosen to live in Queens? <laughs> well, <laughs> I live in Queens because it's a nice place. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, I, but yeah, I like what I like here. What I like about Queens more than anything else is that it's so diverse. And, you know, I raised two kids myself and they were, they were raised like me. They, they, they didn't really make a big deal about the differences in, in the friends and the kids they went to school with and the kids that live next door. Uh, Everybody hung out together. You know, they usually hung out here in, in, in my place right here. All the kids after school would come here and uh, they'd be doing their homework and, you know, they'd be in the kitchen here, you know, making a sandwich. And, it, you know, it didn't really matter. And, uh, uh, and so it was something that, that I was used to. And so it was easy for me to be around people who were different from me. And it was easy for me to be friends with people who are different from me. And it was easy for me to understand uh, that different people had different ideas and perspectives. They lived uh, uh, different lifestyles, but at the same time, you know, there, there was a, a, a way that we could all connect. And we, we did connect when I was growing up. And, and even now, my, my circle of friends is extremely diverse. You and I've had a lot of conversations, obviously, off this camera or podcast about diversity. And I remember one of the most eye-opening things that you've sort of said to me is that, um, you know, often well-intended people like myself will say, hey, I have no problem with somebody from X or Y, you know, coming to live where I live or, or traveling where I travel. Yeah. But you said that's not always enough because you have to ask yourself, would this person feel comfortable coming into that environment? It's more than, and that seems to be a proactive kind of statement that it's not enough to say, yeah, you know, come join, but somehow to make it a place to where they think, you know what, I, I'm here because I'm an outdoorsman. It's not because I'm white or black or, or, or um, Asian. So can you elaborate on that a little more? What is the proactive step, for example, of getting, more um, kids out of that urban setting into the outdoors? 
Well, you know, it's almost like anything else. You know, you have to try it that first time. You know, uh, you have to um, somehow, it's in the case of, of young kids, get them outdoors, uh, let them see what it's like out there, let them see how it is to live out there. Um, and if there are other people out there, and especially if those people are not the same as they are, uh, you know, I think that that exposure, the more exposure you get, the less uh, strange people are, you know, and the more accepting that you can be, you know, and so I'm all about uh, going out and, and, and meeting other people and, and respecting different cultures and being really curious, you know, uh, what's it like to be how you are, you know, and what's it like to live the way you live? I get to ask that, you know, I, I would go up alone to Innerwood Village, you know, let's say in, in Northern uh, uh, Alaska, because I was curious about their lifestyle. And so what happens, the moment I get there, I'm all by myself, I don't know anybody, I've never been there before, I just, you know, I just show up. And before I can get the first question out, they're all over me, what's it like being from New York? Wow, I never saw a black person before. What's, you know, how do you, and, and all of the, the questions that I wanted to ask them, they're asking me. And, and sure enough, you know, within 24 hours, you know, we're all best friends. You know, it's funny, when I was a kid, uh, my father was an airline pilot, so I got to travel a lot of places and he took me up to Alaska and we went to uh, Kutzebue, which is just above the Arctic Circle in Alaska on the coast. And again, a, a native, uh, a local kid came up to me and he said, are you a Jew? And I thought, that's an odd question, right? And, and I guess he's probably heard somehow about Jews and was curious if I was one. And, you know, he asked me that question. I said, no, and we played, you know? And so um, I, th I think that that is one of your hallmarks though, JR, is curiosity. Oh, and, and I think that, um, you know, a, a mutual friend of ours, uh, we, we spoke on this subject, and she said, if you approach a situation with sincerity, it will generally be met with sincerity as well. And so that was good advice and sort of um, going into situations that maybe you don't know what the, the right um, gestures or way to sit down at a table. If you, you know, you meet them with sincerity, generally people will in kind reply with sincerity. I, I absolutely and totally agree with that. And, and all my experience over all these years has, has shown that over and over and over again. Um, in, in most of the places I've been in for, and for most of my life, I was the only guy. I was the only person of color in, a, in an environment where every single other person was different from me. And I was always treated well because, you know, my, my folks, uh, when I was growing up said, you know, treat other people the way you would like them to treat you and you're gonna be fine. And, and, and it's, it's been true, it's absolutely true. Uh, all of the places, you know, whether I met people in the desert or the jungle or the Arctic or wherever, you know, you, you treat them, you know, with, uh, with respect and treat them with kindness the way you want them to treat you. And I found that they treat me exactly the same way. And so uh, that's why I'm optimistic, you know, and, and that's why I believe that, uh, that people are curious about other people, but they have to overcome a certain reluctance uh, before they'll, they'll actually uh, take that step. But once they do, uh, then, then it's great. Then there's no turning back and, and they're, they're going to be good. JR, we're going to leave it off on that. Um, it's really good advice. It's simple advice, and it's been said probably a thousand different ways, but it's great advice. JR, thank you for being on Life's Tough, Explorers Are Tougher. Um, stay curious, my friend. Ah, yeah, thanks a lot for the invite. Always a pleasure talking to you. And if anybody hears this and they want a nice book. <laughs> it's way, way out, out there. there. Way out there. Okay, thanks, JR. All right, thanks a lot.